J is for Justice Podcast. J, I like your podcast. Roberta. Hey guys, welcome back to J is for Justice. I am your host, J, and I hope you are having a fantastic Monday. I am here with your Michigan updates. We haven't done a Michigan update in a little bit, so I've got three important Michigan true crime updates for you now. Detroit is pimping. Mount Clemens is pimping. Romeo is pimping. This next story I am sure will infuriate you. This is a man who is in court for kidnapping an autistic 11-year-old girl and essaying her. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to play the entire arraignment and then you guys can let me know what you think of this situation. Brandon, first name Brandon, last name Hudson. All right, Mr. Hudson, I've got your mailing address on Prest in Detroit, okay? And when you met with Ms. Kleeman, you gave her an email and a phone number. Is that right? Yes. Is it okay if the court uses your email and your phone number to have contact with you? Uh, No, it's fine. Okay, thank you. State of Michigan versus Brandon Hudson, 22F21256. I have received a petition requesting a court-appointed lawyer. I will sign that. You may proceed when you're ready, Ms. Kleeman. Thank you, Assistant Public Defender Melissa Kleeman on behalf of Mr. Hudson. And we have had the chance to meet and go over the complaint together. He waives the formal reading of the charges and stands mute. All right, go ahead, Ms. Reiser. Thank you, Honor. We're asking that the court deny a uh, bond in this matter uh, pursuant to uh, MCR 6.106. Uh, the defendant is charged with criminal sexual conduct in the first degree uh, for the sexual assault of an 11 year old autistic child. Um, he's also charged with kidnapping and unlawful imprisonment. I anticipate that there will be additional um, CSC charges once the um, further DNA is testing is done. He doesn't have any ties to the community. I believe he is a danger to the community. So we're asking that the court deny bond. Um, The child was uh, abducted from Ypsilanti in May of 2022. Uh, She left home on her bike. Uh, Her mother woke up at 11 p.m. to find her bike um, and she was gone. She was dropped off the next morning in Ypsilanti Township by a green vehicle um, and neighbors in the area found her outside and immediately called um, 911. She was taken to the hospital um, and a SANE kit was performed um, and that revealed the CODIS hit uh, from the defendant, in this case, Brandon Hudson. Um, He has a conviction in 2012 for unarmed robbery, where he spent two to 15 years in the Department of Corrections, and he was paroled, I believe, in 2018. 17. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Go go ahead, Ms. Kleeman. Thank you. And I have had, again, the chance to speak with Mr. Hudson, and he did want me to let the court know um, that he does adamantly deny the allegations. Um, In terms of his flight risk, he does have local stable housing at the address provided to the court in Detroit. Um, That is a place that he has lived for the past two years with his aunt and uncle. He does also have local employment. He works full time at a union job. He is the father of one three-year-old daughter who he does provide financial support for. Um, And I do agree that I saw the prior conviction for um, 2012 unarmed robbery, but did not see anything that was similar to these allegations in his criminal history. Um, he is not currently on probation or parole. He has no holds apart from a parking ticket out of Taylor, and we would have no objection to home confinement um, or to a no contact order, not only with the complaining witness, but with anyone under the age of 18. All right. So my this is my usual problem with denying bonds without having an evidentiary hearing. And I don't, I don't think that I, the court rule, Michigan court rule 6.106 regarding pretrial release sub B, sub one, sub B, pretrial release 
uh, the court may deny pretrial release to a defendant charged with criminal sexual conduct in the first degree, armed robbery, or kidnapping with the intent to extort money. So this is not the correct kind of kidnapping. We're still just talking about CSC. Um, if the court finds that proof of the defendant's guilt is evident or the presumption is great. I This is not an evidentiary hearing. No evidence has been presented to me. Um, the statements of counsel are not evidentiary in nature. I don't believe that I can deny bond under that court rule at this proceeding. Um, the point is taken that the basis for charging is uh, DNA evidence that matches Mr. Hudson with DNA from the SANE examination, um, which perhaps if that were presented as evidence, then the court rule would be met. But and I'm happy to, if your honor wants me to forward the MSP lab report, I'm happy to email that. It's a not evidence, though. I, I, I'm not, this is not an evidentiary hearing. So I, I don't see, I, I mean, as I read that court rule, it has to be evidence. And so evidence is something that is admitted into court and through, through testimony. Um, or and and I, that never is happening at an arraignment. Um, if I'm misreading the court rule and someone wants to brief me on that, I'm happy to read it. But my that is that is the way that this court interprets that court rule is that it needs to be based on evidence, and there will never be evidence in an arraignment. Um, so having said that, I'm setting the bond at $250,000 cash or surety, no 10%. No contact with the alleged victims, no weapons, no illegal drugs, no leaving the state of Michigan without permission of the court, no criminal behavior, no assaultive behavior. The probable cause conference will be on September 1st at approximately 9 a.m. We're all set on this one. Thank you. Thank you. You're all set, Mr. Hudson. Okay. Um, oh, okay. You have a question? No, no, I, I, this, this is all news to me. This is all, you know, so everything's weird that's happening right now. So just, yeah, I know. Someone will come in, someone I, from Ms. Clayman's office will come and talk to you soon. I'm a little annoyed out. I'm a little weird. It's a little, everything's it's a little weird right now. It's all just, right, I understand. Someone will come and speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so confused at this. And it looks like the attorney up there, Amy, is confused as well. I didn't know that you had to have an evidentiary hearing to hold someone without bond. I've never heard that. And this man should not be given bond. I don't understand this at all. But I'm no lawyer, but I don't understand why the judge couldn't deny bond based on these charges. The girl was done verbal. You don't get much more evil than that. Rolling into our next update, we have a rapper who is apparently pretty popular in Flint who has been charged in this case that we followed a while back. You guys remember it was in Sterling Heights, Michigan. A woman was pulling out of her um, apartment complex and was shot at. And then she drove back in. I'll just let you guys watch the video. This was a while ago. So maybe this will refresh your memories. Let's take a look. Is a familiar name to many people. Cliff Mack, big time rap artist out of uh, Flint. 
big time future had a big following as well. Look, these video we're going to show you just a little bit of the shooting. It is so disturbing. Broad daylight shooting trying to kill a young woman. Look, immediately authorities thought they knew who the gunman was, but they knew more was to it. So a mountain of cell phone evidence, the feds say, led to this man who calls himself the king of Flint, Cliff Mack, very popular rap artist. <laughs> The video is shocking. The act horrific. That's a young woman in her SUV in Sterling Heights in November of 2020. The feds say lying in wait, Andre Sims, who the feds say agreed to be paid cash to murder the woman. That's the victim's traumatized mother watching, screaming as this murder for hire nearly kills her daughter. She somehow survives. Sims taking money to kill someone who was behind the plot. You Google my name, it's gonna pop up who I wrote on. Today, federal prosecutors charged this man, Clifton Terry III. But as you can see, he's a rap artist. He's out of Flint. He's well known as Cliff Mack. Quit saying y'all looking for me. If I be under the car. Cliff Mack and Andre Sims' cell phones laid out the entire case for prosecutors. That case laid out in this indictment. Dozens of text messages discussing the plan. The phones showing each man's location at the time of the shooting, right there where the shooting took place. Text messages like these spelling out the payment. Cliff Mack texting that he will send $2,500 for Sims' attempted murder. Sims texting back, yeah, that's straight, bro. We put that entire federal indictment on our website. Click on Detroit.com. You can see the string of text messages spelling out what prosecutors say is this murder for hire plot. Again, the young woman survived all of that. Cliff Mack, a uh, rap artist out of Flint. He's in state custody right now. We just checked with federal authorities. He'll be brought into federal custody soon, next couple of days. We're live tonight. Sean Lee. I'll definitely follow this one and see what the outcome is. And the next one is also going to probably infuriate you. This is a story, again, in Michigan, but this is up north. This is um, Houghton Lake, Michigan, which is like up here. Um, a person or two people called nine, two people called 911 and reported that they had fo found four bodies in a house in Houghton Lake, which is Ross Common County, Michigan. And let's find out what happened there, shall we? She was a nurse, a mother, and a wife. She was killed just days after a judge denied her request for a personal protection order. Now her family wants answers into a murder-suicide that has rocked a small Michigan town. What is going on, you guys? This is just crazy. It started off a quiet summer weekend here on the water. Pretty typical for this Houghton Lake community. But on this particular Sunday, that peace was shattered. When I got up on that Sunday morning, the lab was here and the police were all over the place. Early Sunday morning, right around 3.30, inside this house, sheriff's deputies found the bodies of 35-year-old Tyranny Savage, her 13-year-old son Dayton, her mother Kim, and her husband Bo, here inside their home. Investigators say all four had apparent gunshot wounds. Detectives later revealed they believe Bo shot Tyranny, Dayton, and Kim before turning the gun on himself. It really hit me hard because I thought, how could somebody do that? From the outside, Tyranny looked like she was doing really well. She was working on getting two master's degrees. Those who knew her describe her as capable and smart, a devoted mother to her 13-year-old son. On June 27th, the couple separated. That same day, Tyranny asked a district court judge for a personal protection order. She said Bo had stopped taking his meds and bought a gun. According to Tyranny's attorney, Tyranny wrote, he keeps saying he's going to blow his brains out, and I don't want my safety or my son's safety in jeopardy. Three days later, Ross Common County District Judge Troy Daniel denied Tyranny's request, saying there wasn't enough evidence to show Bo was a danger to his family. When that PPO was denied, Tyranny filed for divorce. We reached out to Judge Daniel for comment, but didn't hear back. 
ultimately up to a judge if they are going to grant the protection that someone is seeking. So it's, it's hard to predict. You can't always bank on a PPO being granted. And if all of the specific provisions that a client is seeking, if they're going to be approved by a court. So it's a gamble. You never quite know what a judge is going to rule. A family friend who asked not to be identified says they had no idea Tyranny and Bo were having problems. He called the tragedy devastating and sad. Tyranny's attorney adds, too often people think a strong and capable woman can protect herself, and that is not true. When someone threatens to blow their brains out over a breakup, they're a threat to others as well as themselves, and there are far too many of these incidents for us to ignore the lessons from this tragedy. We hear of red flag laws for those who threaten mass shootings. Perhaps we need a better way for the red flags in domestic cases to be addressed so we can save the next tyranny, Dayton and Kim, from this horrific fate. Um, our last update that we're going to get into is from my hometown of Romeo, Michigan. Um, a diner there caught on fire. And this just gives you a little insight into the community that I was raised in. Um, I love my little town of Romeo. I love all my peeps there. But um, the Four Corners Diner uh, burned down. And this was, this is a, this is a happening spot for my little town here. So this will just give you a little insight into Romeo, Michigan. In the heart of downtown, Romeo is forced to close its doors for the next several weeks after a kitchen fire. Happened at Four Corners Diner on East St. Clair, also known as 32 Mile Road. Megan Woods, though, shows us how the community is rallying around a small business people want to see reopen quickly. This is what's left of the diner's kitchen, and this is where they say the fire started. And now the diner is forced to close for two months. Struggling to get through the pandemic. We, we get through there and then something like this happens. It's hard for the owners of Four Corners Diner not to get teary eyed. Customers say this place is a Romeo staple. Come Wednesday for the mushroom soup <laughs> and Friday for the clam chowder and Thursday for the <laughs> potato soup. It's the meeting place. It's the place you get to you come when you're happy. It's the place where you come when you're sad. But now when people show up, they find signs like this and co-owner Marty Hutnick. She says after closing last Thursday night, she got a call from the business next door saying there was black smoke coming from the roof and through her exhaust. Firefighters got there and were able to put the fire out rather quickly, but the damage was already done. Each stove has to be replaced and we have three stoves. And they still have more assessing to do. While they clean up, customers, other business owners are finding ways to help. Well, I can sell her gift certificates and that way there's some income coming in for her. So I started that right away and people were just like, oh, here, they're just giving me money. They didn't even want the gift certificate. It's just been amazing. I, I've never seen anything like it. The timing of this couldn't be worse. The Peach Festival is less than two weeks away, and that's the diner's busiest weekend of the year. The good thing is the community is coming together to do a raffle and fundraise for the diner during that festival. We'll have more. So, yes, the home of Kid Rock and myself, Romeo, Michigan. Pulling together, it's a great community. It really is. My mom and dad loved living in Romeo, Michigan. But... I'm going to close on that note and conclude your Michigan updates. And I hope everybody has a great Monday. I will see you tomorrow on Tuesday for live stream at 3 p.m. Eastern. Be there or be square, Roberters. I respect you. Have a great day and dance it out. you and your problems I don't give a